Okay, so thanks Graham. Um, those of you that are on Twitter, um, I'm trying to be quite clever tonight. Uh, a lot of the code that we're going to look at is being automatically tweeted every five minutes. Um, so I'm at Dr. Lyndon Walker. Um, I was previously at Lyndon Walker and then it turned out to be a rapper who wanted to buy my Twitter handle. And so it might look, might look like I don't really use Twitter because I don't have many followers and haven't made many tweets, but it's because I gave a rapper my account and <laughs> after, uh, over a beer later on maybe we can, I can tell you the full story. Um, so just by a show of hands, um, how many of you would consider yourselves to be experienced R users? Graham, I think you can put your hand up. Excellent, one. Um, how many of you have used R a bit? Cool, about more than two thirds. How many of you have not really touched R? That also is about two thirds. Okay. <laughs> so the idea of tonight is really, I've tried to pitch it um, in part at the two thirds of you that have never used R. So it is really going back to some basics. And also in part for the two thirds of you who said you were intermediate users of R. Um, where I have kind of got a little bit at the end talking about writing functions and libraries and packages and the stuff that once you can do the basics is really the next step. So as I've said, I'm uh, going to be firing this off um, through Twitter as we go. Uh, we're recording it, it's going to go onto YouTube hopefully clearly enough for you to be able to see. Uh, the slides that you're looking at will also be available online. So those of you that have pen and paper out, um, I don't know, I guess you can write something down if I say something witty, maybe. Um, but it's all going to be there online for you. Uh, it looks like a lot of you have laptops, which is excellent. I, if you don't have a laptop but someone near you does, if you can kind of look over their shoulder, really what I am hoping is that most of you do have a computer in front of you or near you and can actually kind of do the stuff as we go. Um, and for those of you that don't, hopefully it's going to work for you anyway. So, the first thing I thought we would do is just look at the real basics of data, dealing with data, getting data into R. Um, given that I didn't think we would have internet access, um, I'm going to zoom in further for those of you that are at the back, so make, hopefully we'll make it a bit clearer. Um, there are some seats up the front still too. Um, because we don't, I didn't think we would have reliable Wi-Fi access, uh, the data that we're going to work with when we do a couple of graphs and a little bit of uh, work with data is one of the built-in data sets in R. Um, so if you've got R installed on your machine, then that should be all you need for tonight. Um, I'm also only going to be looking at just shots of R itself, so I'm not going to be looking at R Studio or Tinar or kind of the graphical user interfaces and the third party environments and things like that. Uh, at the end I can talk a little bit about that if people are interested in those things. Um, if you have no idea what I'm talking about that's fine too. Uh, as we're going, if you're not sure about anything or want clarification or wonder about something I've typed or just can't see it, um, please stick up your hand and ask. It's much, going to be much easier to have questions as we go, uh, but hopefully we will have time for questions at the end as well. Um, we're not getting booted out of here until 8 and I don't plan on talking for all of the time between now and then, so there should be plenty of question time. Okay, so the very first thing we're going to do is just absolute basics, putting some numbers into R. So, first thing we have, very first line, uh, you can see I've just, rather than having R, which I wasn't able to zoom into, I've got screenshots. So uh, for those of you that have got the laptop, hopefully you've got, everyone's got R up and going on the laptop. Just how many people, because I can't see at the back, how many people have a laptop in front of them? Heaps of you, excellent. If you don't, hopefully you can kind of peer over someone's shoulder or have a look next to you. So we're going to start right at the absolute basics, which is let's just make a variable and so we're going to make a variable x and we're going to put the numbers 1 to 10 into it uh, and with lots of things in R there's lots and lots of different ways you can achieve the same goal um, so for everything that I do tonight there's probably two or three other ways that you might know to do it um, trying to keep things simple 
So if we just type in x, we type in an equals and we type 1 colon 10 and hit enter, that is going to put the numbers from 1 to 10 into our vector x. So anytime you're looking at someone's code, uh, if it's new code you'll see equals. If you're looking at someone who's a little bit old school, um, the other way you can assign something into a variable is actually with a less than sign and a dash, so it kind of looks like an arrow. So anytime you see someone's code uh, where they've got kind of less than and a dash looking like an arrow with something kind of arrowing into something, uh, it probably means they've been using R for a while uh, when R was quite new. Um, they didn't think of using equals as a way of assigning things to other things. Okay. So if we want to look at what's inside any object, we can just type the name of the object. So if we type X and hit enter, we can see that inside of X we've stored 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, so we're keeping up so far? Not telling you to suck eggs too much? No? Good. Okay, so next thing we're going to do is just again make a, another variable. This time we're going to put some text into it. So I want to make a vector. This time I'm going to call it Y. And inside Y I want to store the names of a couple of colours. So again I've got an equals. I've then got the letter C. Whenever you see a letter C and then some brackets immediately after it, what that's going to do is that's going to collate or concatenate whatever's inside those brackets. So this is going to create a vector for me with the words blue, red, green and yellow. You notice that I've got speech marks around each of these. That's telling R to treat it as text, so as a string. If I didn't have my speech marks around yellow, it would go looking for something called yellow and it would come back probably and say there's no such thing as yellow if I hadn't made an object called yellow. So if we type in that, if we're a slow typer then maybe we can just do two colours instead of four colours. Um, hit enter and we'll now have an object Y. <coughs> we can just hit Y, hit enter to see what's been stored inside of Y and we should see our four colours. If we only wanted to look at a single object uh, or a single item inside of Y, then we can use some square brackets. So square brackets uh, are what we use if we want to look at an item within a vector or within an array, depending on which kind of language you like. So if we type Y square brackets 2, then that's going to tell me the second item inside of Y. So if we do that, then it should tell us red. And so when we start doing data processing inside R, uh, the square brackets are really, really useful. Being able to refer to certain parts of a vector or certain items within a data set is really, really handy. Um, we might just be putting numbers in here, but we can also put a, a Boolean or a true-false statement. So I might want to have particular items only. Um, maybe I've got some marketing data and I'm just looking at a particular segment. So I want to say, well, let's just look. Uh, whatever it is that I'm doing, my regression, my cluster analysis, uh, let's just ha have our square brackets and let's just put in some sort of Boolean statement, market segment equals, I don't know, stats lecturers in their 30s. It's probably not a very big segment. Um, and that's going to just give me that, that piece of data. So the square brackets is really handy for me to be able to just look at particular bits of my data. Okay, happy so far? Yep. Ah, right here. Oi. Um, that's just telling me that inside X is a single vector. So, um, in fact, actually, I'm telling you fibs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, if we had a really, really long vector, say if we did X, and in fact, actually, we can try this. Um, if we said X is 1 to, let's say, 1,000, so it's not all going to fit on one line. So if we go X is 1 to 1,000, then we hit X and enter, then we'll get one, two, three, four up to a certain point and then whatever item we're up to square brackets will tell me what item so depending on the size of your screen 
you know, it'd be item 40 or item 28 or depending on whatever resolution you're working on. So it'll tell you, if I'm just listing a single vector, it'll tell you what it's up to. So I'm not sure, I can't see if you've got a laptop there in front of you. Um, but if this was going across multiple lines, it would be saying you're up to here, you're up to here, you're up to here, you're up to here. Okay, so numbers 1 to 10 and colours are kind of not very exciting, so let's get on to some proper data. So with this slide we're going to do two things. We're going to look at some built-in data, uh, and then down the very bottom, which I apologise to those of you at the back, might be a bit tricky to see. I might see if I can zoom on it a little bit. Um, Down the bottom, I've got how we would go about reading in a data file. So because you don't have data files that are on your computer, um, I decided that I would kind of say, here's what the code is, but we won't get too caught up in that. So what we are going to do, though, is we're going to use built-in data sets. So R has a number of built-in data sets. Uh, the one that we're going to use is called cars, and it's got some speed and distance figures. So if we type in data bracket cars, uh, that's going to tell R that we want to access this built-in data set, cars. Just a simple question. How do you find out what data sets are available in R? Excellent question. So if we want to know really any, anything, and I mean data set to be one, but any time we've got a function or something that we want to find out more about, um, question mark. So if we said question mark data, it's going to bring up our help for, um, for the data function. And from memory, but my memory could be a bit rusty, uh, if we go down to the bottom it'll give us a link uh, telling us the data sets that are there. I could be wrong, it may depend a little bit on which version of R we're using. Um, but question mark is going to be very, very useful to you, particularly once you start using R and you start seeing other people's code where they're using functions that maybe you're not sure quite what it does. Um, so for instance you saw someone using this function called head, we could say question mark head, we could bring up the help and we could have a read about it. This is really handy for two things, one is uh, just getting a summary of what a function does, the second, actually three things, second is that if there are multiple parameters that we put into a function, then we can see the different things we could feed into our function. Uh, thirdly at the bottom of most help pages there are examples. So we can actually run a couple of examples and see the function in action and to get a better idea of what it does. So there was a question at the back. Oh no, I was just going to say, if you just run the data function, we'll see which data is available. There we go. So just data bracket bracket? Yep. Yep. Excellent. So there we go, data bracket bracket will give us a list of what is in your particular version of R. So if we go data bracket cars, it's going to read it in. One function which is really quite handy when you're looking at a new data set that you've read in, particularly if it's a really big data set, is the function head. So head will give you the first six rows. Um, for this data set, it's not a very big data set, we could have just typed in cars to look at it, but if we had a really big data set and we don't want it to be scrolling through pages and pages and pages of output, then head brackets, the name of our data set, is going to give us all of our columns so we can see all of our variables, uh, and it's going to give us the first six rows. So we'll get a gauge of what's actually in the data set that we're looking at. If we have this data set cars and we want to refer to a particular, in this case, particular column, so we have a column with speeds and a column with distance, um, then we can use the dollar sign. So if I say cars dollars speed, then it will give me just the speeds. Okay, I'm going to try and zoom down to the bottom. <coughs> Just for those of you at the back that are struggling to see this bit. So this last bit, if we type it in, it's not going to do a whole lot because you guys don't have data sets on your computer. Um, but if we had a data file that we wanted to actually read into R, the main function that we use to do this is 
read and there's some different variants of it so I've got one here read.table there's read.csv there's read.spss there's read I can't remember if it's read.sass or the full kind of sass 7 bat um, for those of you that use sass um, this will let you read a data file into R. When we're reading it in, you can see I've got an equal sign and I've actually assigned it to a variable name. So I'm reading in, if I was going to be reading in a, a data file, I'd be assigning it, in this case, assigning it to something called cars data. Um, inside my brackets, there's lots of different options that I can put in there depending on the kind of data that I'm trying to read in. Um, quite a generic thing to put in there is file.choose. File.choose just opens a Windows file explorer. So instead of file.choose, if I knew the path and the file name of the file I wanted to open, I could just type it in there. Uh, but if I wanted to just use a Windows Explorer and click through and find it, then I could go file.choose. The other one that I've put in there, header equals T, so that's just saying my top line of my data is headings or titles. So that's going to be pretty useful. The other one which is quite useful when we're reading in data, uh, not everyone likes using it though, is called attach. What attach does is attach takes a, a data frame or a data object and it splits it up into separate columns. So with the one that we had up before with cars, you had that object cars and you had speed as a column, you had distance as a column. If I did an attach with cars in the brackets, then it would split it up so I could just refer to speed and I wouldn't have to say car, do, uh, cars dollars speed, I could just say speed. So you can imagine I've got, I've got my matrix with all of my data and it's just chopping all of my columns up so I can refer to a column by itself without having to refer to the object and the column within the object. Some people like doing it that way, some don't. Um, it's very much a kind of a preference thing. Yep. And then you showed a line where you're showing a header. Do you have to reference the data before you can run those other statements, like the head statements? And the so, so R needs to have read in my data before I can look at the top of it. So either, if we were using the, for this we're using the built-in the data set, so we'd say data cars. Um, alternatively, if I was reading in a file of data, then I can use my read.table, assign it to whatever I wanted to call it. So let's say I called it cars data, and then I could say head cars data. So whatever that object is that holds my data file. But we do need to read the data in before we start doing stuff to it. So that data, that data cars is actually reading in the Yes. Um, I, this is maybe a little bit misleading in that because car, cars is an internal data set. So R already knows about it. Um, nor, more commonly what would happen is down here we'd be doing some sort of read table, I'd read in a file of data and that would get me up to here. And then I'd start looking at, okay, what's my first six lines? Let's start graphing it, let's start looking at it, things like that. Is it possible to read multiple files, at a, multiple data at a time? Yeah, um, one of the really nice things with R is that if you had data in a particular format or a particular style, uh, you could write, you could set up some code or you could write your own function that could pretty much read in whatever you wanted, however you wanted. So you might be collecting, say, data from three different databases, and you actually want to end up with an object which has, has them kind of concatenated together somehow, and so you could just write yourself a function to be able to do that each time. Um, so that is one of the really nice things with R, is that it is so, so flexible. You can just, if it doesn't already do what you want it to do, Normally, the first thing you do is see whether someone else has already written the function, because that way you don't even need to engage your brain that much and just go and find, um, find someone else's code. And I'll talk a little bit about libraries and packages a little bit later on. Um, or you can write your own function. Um, and hopefully by the end of today, we'll look at writing a really simple function. So yeah, definitely really, really flexible for being able to read in the data. OK. So we've got some data. And now what I thought we'd do is just draw a couple of quick graphs. So we're going to keep using this cars data because hopefully you all have it. Um, 
first graph we're going to do is just going to be a really simple scatter plot of speed against distance. Depending on which version of R you have, um, as I discovered today, will depend whether you need to put a a, one of those attach statements first. So some of you, if you type in speed right now, R will just spit out all the speeds. It'll, it'll know what you're talking about. Some of you, if you type in speed, it'll go, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, if you're in that second group, if you type in attach brackets cars, then it's going to get that cars data set that we've already read in and it's going to split it up so it knows that speed is a vector of speeds, well, it's a vector of numbers, distance is a vector of numbers, and we can do things with it. Yep? Or could you alternatively have cars dollar speed on cars Absolutely. So the other thing we could do instead uh, is we could be saying cars dollar speed, cars dollars dist, and that would be exactly, um, and again, people, and there's no kind of right or wrong way of um, of dealing with the data like that. Some people like doing it with the dollar signs, other people like just working with the variable names. Um, so yeah, we could have cars, dollars, speed, cars, dollars, dust. Yep? What happens if you have, if you load two data sets that have the same caller name and you attach them both? That's an excellent question. Um, R can get confused. So if we loaded a data set which had the variable names of a data set that we already had, uh, then one would mask the other. Yeah, um, which is something we also need to be a little bit careful of in that it can also mask if we had a function with a particular name so and any local yes, yeah. So if there was a function called speed and then I went and made a, uh, a vector called speed, when I typed in speed it would go, oh here's your vector um, and it would have not forgotten about the function called speed. So it can be good good habit to kind of be using variable names. The more you used R, the less likely it is to happen because you have a really good gauge of what what is and isn't a function name and R does tell you if you are about to um, write something over the top of something um, but it is something that can happen. Um. Okay so if we go plot speed and distance we should get a graphics window come up uh, we should see a very very boring simple plot if we wanted to copy that plot over into Word or we wanted to save it somewhere, we can right click, uh, we can save it as a postscript, we can copy it as a meta file, we can copy it as a bitmap. So there's options for being able to take it, whack it into a report in Word or whatever um, we are writing and where we might want to use the graph. Um, the plot command has lots and lots of other things that we could be adding on the end here. So for instance, if we wanted to have a title on our graph, we could say plot, we could have speed, we could have dist. Uh, after that, we put another comma, and then we could say main equals, and then in speech marks, whatever we want to call the title. And that will be able to put a title. And so titles, labels, axes, colors of the points, kind of points, whether you have points, whether you have lines, whether you have little animated dancing triangles and stars, pretty much whatever you like you can do there. Um, and again here's where if we go question mark plot we can see page after page of different things that we could be putting after the two variables. Yep. Uh, I honestly couldn't tell you. I, I haven't used GNU plot, so I don't know. I don't know if there's someone else here that could answer that question, which is whether plot is like GNU plot. No, that's okay. Okay, so we've got a plot. Some of you might have put a title on your plot as well. So let's do another plot. Um, for most graphs the plot command is going to be able to do what we want. Uh, if we wanted a histogram, maybe we're looking at some residuals out of a regression, we wanted to look at a histogram, then just HIST brackets and then whatever we want to draw a histogram of. Again, there's just tons and tons of things that we could be putting in there after speed to be able to put a better title and labels and axes and shift the widths of our bars and pretty much anything else that we might want to do to our graph. 
uh, but we're just keeping it simple for now. So we've got a histogram coming up. <coughs> yep. Excellent. Okay, so what we're going to do now, uh, we've drawn a couple of graphs, looked at a couple of basic commands for uh, putting some data and making some data in R. Uh, we're just going to do a couple of simple, simple summary stats. We are going to do a regression, um, and then we're going to move on to some stuff about libraries and packages. Okay, so is that visible for you guys at the back? Yeah? A little bit of a nod? Top of it is. Sorry? The top, of it is. top of it is. Okay, well I can, I'll, I'll, I'll shift it up one swip. Okay, so any, any particular um, summary stat, means and minimums and maximums and standard deviations and variances and so on, all the functions are all built into R. Um, if we have fancier stuff that we want to calculate, quite often there will be packages that already do it, and again, if not, we can write our own functions. So, any time we're seeing a word with brackets immediate, round brackets immediately after us, this is a function. So, with the top one, we've got mean, bracket speed, and it's calculating the mean. Next one down, VAR, bracket speed, is calculating the variance of, again, of that set of numbers uh, for speed. The next one that I've used, summary, I've done summary of speed and I've got the five number summary, so minimum, maximum, quartiles, median. For some reason it also throws the mean in there as well. So those are all pretty straightforward and really the ones that I wanted to focus on a little bit more um, are these two, or particularly this one. So, we might even zoom in a little bit. Those of you that haven't used Prezi, it can get a little bit temperamental when you start zooming. So, in here, I've got something that I've called speed model. Just a name that I, an object that I've decided to make. The function that I'm using, LM, LM stands for linear model. If I'm doing any kind of linear regression, I'm going to be using LM. If I want to get fancier, if I'm using some sort of generalized linear regression, so I'm doing log linear, I'm doing Poisson, I'm doing things like that, then there is a GLM. If I'm getting even fancier still, there's lots of other functions for uh, more advanced modeling. But for today, we're just doing a really simple regression, and so we are going to regress uh, distance uh, using speed. So that is maybe a bit blurry, so we've got our LM, we've got brackets, we've got dist for our distance. This sign in here, which might be a bit blurry at the back, is a tilde sign. And so this is just saying, let's model distance as a function of whatever I put after it. In this case, we're just doing distance as a function of speed, but if I wanted to have a multiple regression, if I wanted to say speed plus car type plus fuel plus sunshine plus earthquake plus whatever we liked, we could just keep carrying on, we could put interaction effects, we can uh, put categorical variables and it will quite happily do our regression for us. So we'll type this in, we'll hit enter, yep. Uh, so it would just be plus, so if I, wanted, if I wanted a model that had this and this and this and this, plus this, plus this, plus this, oh, it's, yeah. it's a linear model so it's just basically it's showing the additive model that you're going to be putting in. So yes, yeah, so it would just be pluses. There could then, after the model, be commas and other uh, other things that we're putting into the function as well. Um, more so if we were using the GLM function, after we'd put in our model, then we'd be putting in uh, what our link function is, so if it was um, Poisson or log or that kind of thing. So anything else that we need to tell R about to do our regression. For this one, because it's just a nice simple x against y, this is all we need. Um, but yeah, we would just have plus if we were adding more stuff into a multiple regression. Okay, so we've made this thing called speed model. It has stored our regression in it. It's actually got a whole lot of elements to it. If we went and looked inside this thing that I made called speed model, 
it's got my coefficients, it's got my p-values, it's got my residuals, it's got my predicted values, it's got my confidence intervals. There's a whole lot of things. So I can say speed model, dollar sign, and there's a whole lot of different things such as my coefficients, such as my residuals that I can refer to individually. First thing I normally want to do though if I'm doing a regression is get all excited about my p-values and so in order to see a very quick summary of my regression model I can type in summary brackets and speed model. You notice I actually used the same function as I did up here and it's done something completely different. So a lot of the R functions will be able to look at what you're giving them and figure out what you're wanting. So when I gave the summary function just a vector of numbers called speed, gave me some summary stats. When I gave the summary function a regression model, it said, ah, it's a regression model. Let's so tell him what his regression model was in case he forgot. Let's tell him about his residuals. Let's come down a little bit. Let's scroll out a little bit. Let's tell him about the stuff that he's probably excited about. So we did our regression, there's our intercept, there's our slope for speed, here's our p-values down the end, we've got our adjusted r squared, we've got our f stat, we've got all the normal stuff that we get out of SPSS or R or whatever other uh, software that you might be using currently. Um, again, we can go into that regression object, we can just pull out individual bits if we like, but this is just really convenient for that was two lines of code for me to do a regression, look at all the key stuff out of the regression. If I was doing lots of regressions in my job, then I could just have a function that would just grab them, do it, do it, do it, save everything. Um, something I didn't mention at the start, and maybe should have, really, really good idea is to save your R code. When you're typing stuff into R, R remembers vectors and it remembers the stuff you did. It doesn't remember the actual things you typed in. So having a text file, uh, and earlier on I mentioned R Studio and I mentioned Tin R, uh, these are slightly more specialized programs where you can put your R code in, it will take your R code, it will save it, but it will also transfer it into R to actually do the analysis for you. So that way if you save your code, um, you can just copy and paste, you can run it over and over and over again. So really, really good idea. The other quite handy trick, uh, particularly if you make a typo, is the up arrow. If you hit the up arrow, that'll give you your last piece of code that you typed in. And if you hit the up arrow twice, you can get to the second last, third to last. So if there was something that you entered and then you wanted to go back to it, you can just up arrow and scroll, scroll back through the, the commands you'd already entered. Okay, anyone have any questions about regression? Because I think it's quite a popular thing for people to start doing those of you that are uh, eyeing up all those Kaggle competitions and all the millions of dollars that you can win. Okay, this is probably a bit small for you to see. So for fancier things there are lots and lots of libraries and packages that you can find that people have already written that do I'll say almost anything you can imagine. All sorts of very, very, some cases broad sets of analyses, and some cases very specialised pieces of analyses. One that I've been using quite recently is Twit R, which will actually let you put in a Twitter username and retrieve a whole lot of stats on followers, location, uh, the text, actually what's being tweeted, which you can then, there's another package, um, TM, which is a text miner. So putting a couple of packages together, um, something I've been doing for an education paper I've been writing is using, using the Twitter package, getting some Twitter data, using the text mining package, using a social network package to be able to draw pictures, see how people are linked together as followers and followees. Um, and it's all stuff that is already sitting there because someone already had the good idea before me, has already written the code. So all I had to do was go to the CRAN website and this is, I think this is kind of AA through to AC or something like that. There's over a thousand packages in there. Um, so pretty much cran.r-project.org, which is where you went to download R. It's a um, link that says packages and you can just scroll through and have a look and see what's there. And there is, there's just all sorts of stuff. 
uh, and really, really handy um, for all sorts of things. Um, so those are all there to get those into R on your computer. Just within R, you just go to Packages, you go to Install Packages, it'll ask you which server you want to use, it doesn't really matter. Lots of people pick Argentina because it's at the top, Australia's not that far underneath, you could probably pick Australia, it might be a little bit faster. Um, scroll through, find the package you want, install it, it's now on your computer to use. So lots and lots of packages, um, very, very straightforward process. Uh, on the CRAN site, you'll find that they are all set up in exactly the same way. They will tell you the name of the package, they'll give you a PDF which has all of the individual functions that are inside it. Each function will have description of what it does with a couple of little examples. Um, so being able to pick up someone else's package or library and use it is really generally pretty straightforward uh, and really, really handy because there's some really quite clever and useful stuff on there. So we're not going to do that because we don't have internet connection. Um, but definitely go have a look, see, see what packages are there. They, there is all sorts of interesting and useful stuff for pretty much any discipline you're in. Um, I've seen everything from, I guess kind of not surprisingly, a lot of text mining, finance, um, neural networks and social, um, social network analysis and things like that through to, I'm pretty sure there's even one for sharks, gonads. Um, <laughs> if you want to model the structure of those. Um, so pretty much anything you can imagine, well over a thousand packages. In terms of name or in terms of what they do? They, that's a really good question, I would suspect not. So you may have packages which have things of the same name that do slightly different stuff. Um, but normally you're not going to be running all thousand at once, so you're not, I, I've never had it run into it as an issue. Um, quite often you will have packages that use other packages. When you install it, it will actually say, it will say, hey, you've installed the Twitter package, in order to use this you need the text mining and you need this and you need this and you need this. Uh, and it will go and retrieve those, to, the, those for you as well. So it, it's pretty good with working out what other stuff you might need if there's a package that refers to other ones. Okay, so I gave you a break from using your computer, but I thought we would um, come back and do one more, one more thing in R. So this is maybe a little bit more advanced, uh, where we're going to write a function. Or well, you're going to write a function, I already wrote the function. So this is a really, really simple function, but just to show you how easy it is to write a function. Uh, it's a pretty boring function. For this one I just wanted to have a function that could take a number, work out two times that number plus one, which I could just type in and use R as a calculator, but we'll just pretend I couldn't, um, and return 2x plus one. So we'll zoom in so we can see it a bit more clearly. No we won't. Yes we will. Okay, so I've called my function my function and in order to make a function we use a function called function uh, which I don't know, maybe makes good sense. When we're typing stuff in anytime we ever see a plus a plus is telling me that I haven't finished my current line or my current statement. When we're putting in a function, this is important because our functions might have multiple lines. If we're doing something fancy, it might go on and on for quite a lot. Normally, if I was writing a function, I would be doing it in a text editor, then putting it over to R, but we're going to do it straight into R. So what we've got is I'm going to make this function called my function. We've got our equal sign to assign it. I'm going to use this function called function. We've got our open brackets. Inside the brackets, uh, whatever my function needs to be passed. And so my function needs to be passed just a number. And I decided to call it number. We could call it whatever we liked. Um, if we wanted to make the, my function a little bit more foolproof, um, we could 
have a default number. So we could, instead of just saying, you're going to get this thing called number, we could say, you're going to get this thing called number, but by default it is equal to, and we could put something in there. We're not going to, though. We're keeping this nice and simple. Uh, the one thing that's probably a bit hard for you to see, especially at the back, this is a curly bracket. So this is kind of a curly braces bracket. When we put a curly braces bracket in there, it's telling R, don't start processing this until we close the curly bracket. So that way we can put multiple lines in and it's not going to start trying to do stuff with them until we've closed it off. Is it possible to edit the function once you've um, entered it? For example, you make a mistake. As I yes. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, so I guess there's two bits to answering that question. If I, if I had entered all of it and I was back to a fresh cursor, then I could just enter it again and it'll overwrite it, except with my mistake fixed. If I made a typo somewhere in here, and I've already, maybe I made a typo in here, and now I've gone down onto this line, but I've still got a plus, so I haven't actually closed off my statement yet, uh, I would probably just close off my statement, it'll give me an error message, and then I'll go back and fix it. If I'm still on the same line, I'll just scroll back with the arrow key and fix it. Yes, yeah. So um, yeah, once you committed it, then basically you you go back in and you'll overwrite, and the new my function will take precedence over the old one. Yes, yep. So we could use the up arrow to go back to the uh, the lines that we'd entered. Um, so the the correct lines. Um, this is where kind of doing this in a text editor much, much easier, because I can go, I can fix my typo, I can copy and paste the whole lot over. Yes? Yes, you could do. Yes? You could. But then if we were doing that, then hopefully we'd have RStudio and we'd do it properly. I mean, I, I kind of completely, yeah, so we can, we can make a script and do it that way. Um, I guess I'm trying to, I want to emphasize that using something like Tanara R Studio would be the preferred way. And so this, I'm really emphasizing this as being bad. Okay. And also kind of the, the pluses and the, 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 the brackets and yeah. So yeah, yes, yeah, so you're 100% right, but there was like some intention to doing it badly. Um, okay, so We've got our curly bracket. Um, again, I've just m had a thing that I'm going to call output. And again, if we were programming this nicely, we could have this all as a single statement. We could just say return and have my statement inside the return. I'm kind of splitting it up some more to try and keep it kind of, I guess, bad but simple at the same time. Um, so we've got our output. We're going to go two times the number that we passed in plus one. And then our next thing, return, is telling us what's my function going to send back out. When I run the function, what are we going to see afterwards? Close our squiggly brackets, and then we can test it out. So if I go my function brackets 5, tells me 11, which is what it should do. Uh, then I tried to be a little bit more clever, and I said my function 1 to 10 and it'll happily take a vector instead of a single number and it'll do the operation on each element of the vector and it gives me 2x plus 1 for each of the items out of my vector. So this is a really really dumbed down way of kind of showing you what a function is and how we could write a function um, but something that's incredibly incredibly handy anytime I've got any kind of task that I'm going to be repeating, if I've got a combination of things that I need to put together, um, if I just want to have some code which is flexible and reusable, then functions really, really useful, powerful way of doing things. If I have some sort of really clever analysis no one's thought of before, write my own function. If I'm really enthused, I can write my own package and then I can put it up on the CRAN site and there can be 1,201. And everyone can see how clever I am because I put a package there. Okay. Yes? Uh, there's no type check on the function. What happens if you call it a string? Then it will tell you that you are very silly to be making a function with this. Um, again, for those of you that do do programming, 
we could put error checking in there, we could check that the number is a number, um, we can, I was kind of focusing on function rather than good programming, so if we were going with good programming, we would have some check in there to make sure that the person's giving it the right thing and giving kind of a sensible error message describing to them what they're doing wrong, if they're doing it wrong. And I guess this it's more because we can put, have as an argument a single number or a vector. Yep. And that's interesting in itself. Well, I think that that's just R in general will take anywhere where it would take a number. If you give it a vector, it will just do that repeated process on the vector, the elements of the vector instead. And for some things, that's really, really handy. For other things, it's not so handy. So yeah, you, you, could, have, you could have a function that you write where you want to specify, I only want a single number. Don't give it a vector. Don't give it a string. Don't do anything stupid with it. Um, but yeah, in terms of error checking, Good programming, we, we, could, we could add that kind of stuff in as well. Um, Any time we're using an R function, if we just type in the name of the function, we will see it. So if you go and type in my function and you don't whack a number in there, you can, you'll see the code that you typed in, which you can also do for other people's functions. So you can go and you can look at what they've had as their function and this is really useful for seeing the standard way of putting in things like the error checking um, the structure in which people would write a function if it's something that other people are going to be using it's I mean I I can't think of anything that I've used that I would kind of relate it to. Um, I mean it's kind of its own thing. Um, in a lot of ways it's, it's a lot more simple than say you know, something like Java or C plus or um, one of those kind of languages. Um, yeah. Yep. Um, leads very nicely onto my next slide as well. Thank you. Which is where you could go from here. Um, and so there's multiple Google groups and mailing lists which are really useful for, and we might zoom that, it does look a little bit small. So I will be putting the link to these slides up on, uh, on the Meetup site, so you'll all be able to get access to these slides to be able to get the URLs which are um, a tad long. Um, there's a number of Google groups and mailing lists, both international and Australasian ones, which are really useful for being able to very quickly pick people's brains if there's something that's not working and you're not sure why it's not working. Um, and I guess depending on whether you want kind of a fast response or a sarcastic response or a smart response, kind of will depend which one you pick. Um, but they are really useful for being able to ask quick questions. On the CRAN site, there's a number of different manuals. Uh, one which I would recommend is the R intro, uh, which I've got the full link to. And again, you can get the slides to get that full link. Uh, it's about 100 pages. It goes through everything we did tonight, but in much more detail, um, and kind of fills in all the gaps as well of the stuff that I've glossed over. Um, so that's, if I was gonna go to a, kind of an, an intro thing to then, start filling in some of the gaps um, and kind of getting more detail in terms of what you've seen tonight. That's where I would go. Um, but I've given some other links. One has uh, R tutorials from a whole lot of universities around the world. Um, Revolutionary Analytics is the commercial version of R. Um, and again, I've sorry for chopping off the end there. Um, they have a beginner's tips page which has some really helpful tips and links and videos and things like that. Uh, Jeremy Anglum who is one of the organizers of this meetup group uh, has a blog and often has useful stuff about R and one of them is kind of a series of intro videos. Um, those of you that are on Twitter, R Lang Tip gives you an R tip every day. Uh, another quite useful site for those of you that are maybe more intermediate is R Bloggers. Um, which is lots of people from around the world that contribute cool and interesting R stuff. Um, and the last one is this meetup group. 
Uh, every month there is someone speaking. It is on all sorts of different and interesting things um, from business applications, academic applications. Um, we've seen R uh, used for neuroimaging and brain scans, uh, financial stuff, people that have entered Kaggle competitions and won. Um, so all sorts of different applications of R. Um, normally they have a mix of kind of the what they're doing and a little bit of the code of how they're doing it and just seeing what people are using R for and a little bit of their code is really really helpful for developing your own skills as well. Can I um, add another one? To yes. Um, I've been learning R this year and uh, really useful resources are R podcast. R podcast. Yeah, yep. just a re uh, recently new podcast um, by Eric Nance and uh, I find it really useful. He goes starts from the real basic uh, stuff and then just progresses um, for each episode. Yep. Um, yeah, it's just yeah, it's quite good. Yeah, recommend that. Excellent. So the R the R podcast is there an easy way to Google, um, Google search? So there's one oh, thing you yeah, find is <laughs> yeah, I, iTunes. Uh, you can find it on there. Yep. Download it. Um, it's also on Twitter or if you just type in R podcast in Google. Okay. The website's just R hyphen podcast dot org. R hyphen podcast dot org. Yeah. So r-podcast.org, um, sounds excellent. Yeah. And yeah, very much just, that was one I hadn't heard of. Um, just talking, talking to people that are using R, um, you will generally learn something. Different people are using it for all sorts of different clever things. So I think that's about an hour. Um, I think at this stage we will stop and if you've got any further questions, um, <coughs> feel free to ask any more questions. Otherwise, I think that's pretty much it. Yes? Just to ask you, the R processing happens because it happens on the local machine. Yes. When you use it. So when you're having really massive big data, and I'm talking yep. 1.6 million, yep. Five, yep. 600 columns and stuff like that, because it's very big, even when you put 64 bits, yes. not working with 32 yep. bits, it is very difficult to process that. Yep. Is there a way to overcome? Has anybody worked? Kind of. Through? That's that's a really good question. So those of you at the back, the question was about using R with big and really, really big data. Um, certainly, historically, one of the one of the criticisms of R, particularly relative to SAS, yes. has been the handling of big data uh, and memory management and the speed of some of the processing of things. Um, the things to look at, I mean, the first one is in terms of the code that you're running, making sure all of the code is written uh, as efficiently as possible. Um, beyond that, for the big data, uh, there is a, I think it's, about six months, maybe a little bit older, um, some parallel processing functions. So people have done some kind of functions for doing using R on grid, grid computing resources. So if you are doing things that can be split, uh, split across if you have access to grid, cluster computing, multiple cores, things like that, um, there are some functions in parallel processing. Um, the slightly more old school way of uh, dealing with it is to get R to talk to another language. The one that I've seen most commonly but I would not necessarily recommend is Fortran. Um, for those of you that have used computers for a while, Fortran may ring some bells. Um, I've seen people using Fortran in C and almost kind of to get around particularly the memory management issues dealing with data almost on kind of line by line basis and splitting it up and doing things outside of R and bringing it back to R. But it's quite a difficult and quite a messy way of going about it. So I would probably look at the parallel processing first before I kind of resorted to other things. Any other questions? Yep. For the rank beginner with a programming background, Yes. how many hours do I need to stay up at night to get good at this? Tonight or this week or like over the next year or um, For someone that has programmed before, uh, I would say that this should be very, very simple to pick up. Um, I I don't know. It, it, some of it depends on whether you're using it regularly at work as well, or if kind of this is just an extra thing that you're trying to learn. Um, I would say in a month that you, you kind of have covered enough to call yourself proficient 
um, which kind of, I think on a CV, normally turns into intermediate slash expert. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I would, if, if you've already got a programming background, I would say not long at all. It's, the language is very, very straightforward. The structures and the logic of it are very simple. Certainly for my, my experience, I mean, I guess I started with R and I've done a bit of Java. Um, and I've done some other languages and I found every so often there'll be a program like this which has its own little programming language and the logic doesn't quite fit with normal programming. I haven't myself experienced that with R. R was, R was quite straightforward to learn. Um, I would say hopefully not too long. Yep? In terms of training data related data sets or small, is that something that R facilitates or is it more um, was it suggested that training data happens before you implement it? Uh, I guess it's very much a what software you like using. Um, I've seen people that will put the, if it's not, if the data's not that big, they'll put it into Excel spreadsheets and kind of do some of the data cleaning there, then put it into R. Uh, other people love R, will put it straight into R, will start kind of plotting and examining and um, yeah, you can write little functions if you, um, if you for instance maybe had some sort of machine generated data and you knew that every so often you were going to get some value above a certain point or you had missing values yeah you could write some functions that could go through could automatically go okay if I see a if I see a 9999 that actually means this I'm going to convert it so certainly being able to write functions to deal with some of the data cleaning is really nice and so on that side of things using R for data cleaning is really good um, some people like looking at spreadsheets, in which case, yeah, if, if that's you, you kind of you come, your approach that you're comfortable with, you might use Excel, get the data ready, save it as a CSV, do your analysis now, but not the cleaning. So, so, so I think it's very much a personal preference kind of thing. The um, the the functions definitely do make it. If if there's kind of regular repeated things that you do in your data cleaning, it makes it a lot quicker and easier though. My question is very sensitive, my apology, but I'm wondering what's the difference or advantages of using R instead of Excel or other spreadsheet programs? Um, so the question was the advantage of using R instead of Excel or other spreadsheet programs. I guess the amount of built-in analysis, like if we're wanting to actually do statistics on the data, not just look at it and graph it and have a couple of if statements, then R immediately has all, all of kind of, I'll say the basic, but kind of basic, intermediate, yeah, even, even kind of fairly advanced statistical methods, and then thousands and thousands of packages with much more advanced things. You could go and write these in Visual Basic yourself if you wanted. Um, you could get add-ins to do some of that in Excel as well. So Excel could do it. Um, to my mind, R is going to do it quicker and easier. Um, and is really set up for the analysis side of things, whereas Excel is a spreadsheet that you can write Visual Basic and you can do macros and you can have add-ins and it, it can do that stuff, um, but it gets to a point where it can't really do much more easily and I will just keep carrying on with, with much more substantial stats.